He made him in the hollow skin from the heart of the holy tree. He compassed the earth therein, and man was the war of the sea. He controlled the vigorous steam, he harnessed the lightning for hire, he drove the celestial team, and man was the war of the fire. It's Friday, March 11th, 4.22 a.m. I'm going to read chapter 1 of part 3 of book 4, The Principles of Ritual. There is a single main definition of the object of all magical ritual. It is the uniting of the microcosm with the macrocosm. The supreme and complete ritual is therefore the invocation of the holy guardian angel, or in the language of mysticism, union with God. See the book of the sacred magic of Abramel and the mage, in Liber 418, the 8th Ether. Liber Samek, Appendix 4 of this book. The difference between these operations is more of theoretical than of practical importance. All other magical rituals are particular cases of this general principle, and the only excuse for doing them is that it sometimes occurs that one particular portion of the microcosm is so weak that its imperfection of impurity would vitiate the macrocosm of which it is the image. For example, God is above sex, and therefore neither man nor woman as such can be said to fully understand, much less to represent God. It is therefore incumbent on the male magician to cultivate those female virtues in which he is deficient. In this task he must of course accomplish without in any way impairing his virility. It will then be lawful for a magician to invoke Isis and identify himself with her. If he fails to do this, his apprehension of the universe when he attains Samadhi will lack the conception of maternity. The result will be a metaphysical and by corollary ethical limitation in the religion which he founds. Judaism and Islam are striking examples of this failure. To take another example, the ascetic life which devotion to magic so often involves argues a poverty of nature, a narrowness, a lack of generosity. Nature is infinitely prodigal. Not one in a million seeds ever comes to fruition. Whoso fails to recognize this, let him invoke Jupiter. There are much deep considerations in which it appears that everything that is, is right. They are set forth in part four. We can only summarize them here by saying that the survival of the fittest is their upshot. The danger of ceremonial magic, the subtlest and deepest danger, is this, that the magician will naturally tend to invoke that partial being which most strongly appeals to him, so that his natural excess in that direction will be still further exaggerated. Let him before beginning his work endeavor to map out his own being, and arrange his invocations in such a way as to redress the balance. The ideal method of doing this is in Liber 913. See also Liber LF. This, of course, should have been done in a preliminary fashion during the preparation of the weapons and furniture of the temple. To consider in a more particular manner this question of the nature of ritual, we may suppose that he finds himself lacking in that perception of the value of life and death, alike of individuals and races, which is characteristic of nature. He has perhaps a tendency to perceive the first noble truth uttered by Buddha, that everything is sorrow. Nature, it seems, is a tragedy. He has perhaps even experienced the great trance called sorrow. He should then consider whether there is not some deity who expresses this cycle, and whose nature is joy. He will find what he requires in the Greek Dionysus, or Bacchus, a distortion of whose rites form the central mystery of the Christian religion. There are three main methods of invoking any deity. The first method consists of devotion to that deity, and being mainly mystical in character, need not be dealt with in this place, especially as a perfect instruction exists in Liber 175. The second method is the straightforward ceremonial invocation. It was the method which was usually employed in the Middle Ages. Its advantage is its directness, its disadvantage its crudity. The Goetia gives clear instruction in this method, and so do many other rituals white and black. We shall presently devote some space to a clear exposition of this art. In the case of Bacchus, however, we may roughly outline the procedure. We find that the symbolism of Tifereth expresses the nature of Bacchus. It is then necessary to construct a ritual of Tifereth. Let us open the book 777. We shall find in line 6 of each column the various parts of our required apparatus. Having ordered everything duly, we shall exalt the mind by repeated prayers or conjurations to the highest conception of God, until, in one sense or another of the word, he appears to us and floods our consciousness with the light of his divinity. The third method is the dramatic, perhaps the most attractive of all. Certainly so it is to the artist's temperament, for it appeals to his imagination through his aesthetic sense. 
Its disadvantage lies principally in the difficulty of its performance by a single person, but it has the sanction of the highest antiquity, and is probably the most useful basis for the foundation of a religion. It is the legend of Catholic Christianity, and consists in the dramatization of the legend of the god. The Bacchae of Euripides is a magnificent example of such a ritual, so also, though in a much less degree, is the Mass. We may also mention many of the degrees in Freemasonry, particularly the third. The five-six ritual published in Volume 1, Number 3 of the Equinox is another example. In the case of Bacchus, one commemorates firstly his birth of a mortal mother who has yielded her treasure house to the father of all, of the jealousy and rage afforded by this incarnation, and of the heavenly protection afforded to the infant. Next, should be commemorated the journeying westward upon an ass. Now comes the great scene of the drama. The gentle, exquisite youth with his following, chiefly composed of women, seems to threaten the established order of things, and that established order takes steps to put an end to the upstart. We find Dionysus confronting the angry king, not with defiance but with meekness, yet with a subtle confidence and underlying laughter. His forehead is wreathed with vine tendrils. He is an effeminate figure with those broad leaves clustered upon his brow. But those leaves hide horns. King Pentheus, representative of respectability, is destroyed by his pride. There is a much deeper interpretation in which Pentheus is himself the dying god. See My Good Hunting in the International in New York, March 1918, in the Revival of Magic and Other Essays, and Dr. J.G. Frazier's Golden Bow, Adonis Addis Osiris. He goes out into the mountains to attack the women who have followed Bacchus, the youth who he has mocked, scourged, and put in chains, yet who has only smiled, and by those women in their divine madness he has torn to pieces. It has already seemed impertinent to say so much when Walter Pater has told the story with such sympathy and insight. We will not further transgress by dwelling upon the identity of this legend, with the course of nature, its madness, its prodigality, its intoxication, its joy, and above all its sublime persistence through the cycles of life and death. The pagan reader must labor to understand this in Pater's Greek studies, and the Christian reader will recognize it incident for incident in the story of Christ. This legend is but the dramatization of spring. The magician who wishes to invoke Bacchus by this method must therefore arrange a ceremony in which he takes the part of Bacchus, undergoes all his trials, and emerges triumphant from beyond death. He must, however, be warned against mistaking the symbolism. In this case, for example, the doctrine of individual immortality has been dragged in to the destruction of truth. It is not that utterly worthless part of man, his individual consciousness is John Smith, which defies death. That consciousness which dies is reborn in every thought. That which persists, if anything persists, is his real John Smithness, a quality of which he was probably never conscious in his life. See the Book of Lies, Lever 333, for several sermons to this effect. Caps Alpha, Delta, Heta, Iota, Eta, Iota, F, Iota, Heta, Kappa, Alpha, Kappa, Heta, and Lambda in particular. The reincarnation of the Ku, or magical self, is another matter entirely, too abstruse to discuss in this elementary manual. Even that does not persist unchanged, it is always growing. The cross is a barren stick, and the petals of the rose fall in decay. But in the union of the cross and the rose is a constant succession of new lives. See again the Book of Lies, Library 333, for several sermons to this effect. The whole theory of death must be sought in Library 111, Aleph. Without this union and without this death of the individual, the cycle would be broken. A chapter will be consecrated to removing the practical difficulties of this method of invocation. It will doubtless have been noted by the acumen of the reader that in the great essentials these three methods are one. In each case, the magician identifies himself with the deity invoked. To invoke is to call in, just as to evoke is to call forth or out. This is the essential difference between the two branches of magic. In invocation, the macrocosm floods the consciousness. In evocation, the magician, having become the macrocosm, creates a microcosm. You invoke a god into the circle. You evoke a spirit into the triangle. In the first method, identity with the god is attained by love and by surrender, by giving up or suppressing all irrelevant and illusory parts of yourself. It is the weeding of a garden. In the second method, identity is attained by paying special attention to the desired part of yourself, positive as the first method is negative. It is the potting out and watering of a particular flower in the garden, and the exposure of it to the sun. In the third, identity is attained by sympathy. 
it is very difficult for the ordinary man to lose himself completely in the subject of a play or of a novel, but for those who can do so, this method is unquestionably the best. Observe, each element in the cycle is of equal value. It is wrong to say triumphantly, mors janua vitae, or death is the gate of life, unless you add with equal triumph, vita janua mortis, life is the gate of death. To one who understands this chain of the eons from the point of view alike of the sorrowing Isis and the triumphant Osiris, not forgetting their link in the destroyer Apophis, there remains no secret veiled in nature. He cries the name of that god which throughout history has been echoed by one religion to another, the infinite swelling peon, Iao. This name, Iao, is kabbalistically identical with that of the beast, and with his number sits at six so that he who invokes the former invokes also the latter, also with Iwas in the number 93. See chapter 5. 